Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, last Clarin Cafe for uh, the year 2022. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, host uh, today the uh, Clarin Cafe uh, dedicated to the Voices from Ravens Ravensbrück uh, uh, project, uh, Ra Voices from Ravensbrück on the web, a multilingual channel. Um, Clar what is a Clarin Cafe for those uh, who are new to it? Uh, Clarin Cafe is an informal and interactive space uh, uh, of discussion for researchers, lecturers, uh, students, uh, experts, uh, and beyond to um, meet and share experiences and insights uh, uh, on various topics that have potential relevance uh, for uh, the activities and developments uh, um, within the context of the Clarin Eric research infrastructure. And uh, if you don't know uh, what Clarin Eric is, uh, you will find out uh, in a few uh, minutes uh, um, because I will be uh, giving a short introduction to, to Clarin as I am your Clarin host for today uh, from the Clarin Eric Board of Directors and my name is Francesca Frontini. This cafe was organized by uh, a group of uh, friends here, Silvia, Christoph, Hank, uh, Arian and, uh, and Steph. Uh, who uh, basically are presenting and discussing uh, their work within the framework of a Clarin funded project, the Voices from Brook Resource Family Project. Uh, the technical support uh, is provided uh, by David Bourdon. And uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, this event is recorded uh, for further dissemin dissemination purposes. So if you would like to uh, avoid being recorded, uh, uh, you uh, please keep your microphone and camera uh, shut. You can, of course, still use uh, the um, comments, uh, the chat box for comments and questions. So this is the program for today. As I said, uh, I will be giving a short introduction. Um, to Clarin and also to the resource families, which is the context within which this project was uh, organized. Then uh, Steph and Silvia will present the project itself. Uh, and then uh, we will be uh, discussing a little bit closer with Hank uh, van den Heuvel, uh, the metadata scheme that was used for this, uh, these uh, oral uh, archives. And then Christoph will uh, talk about uh, the machine, so the transcription chain, which is, by the way, planning to use also on our own Clarin cafes. So uh, this is the latest news from uh, the pre-cafe discussion. And then we will hear about uh, uh, lesson in troubleshooting, how to integrate oral history data in the Clarin ecosystem by the speech and tech group. And then we will be uh, opening our discussion. So um, we have actually, for those who are not so new to Clarin, we have a new uh, Clarin video. And I think that David will put the link in the chat. So if you want to, to watch it, but uh, given that the uh, time today is limited, uh, we will not uh, show it uh, live. And um, so what is Clarin for those who are instead new? It is, stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. Um, it is an, an ERIC, uh, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, uh, like uh, it's a legal entity, and it has been uh, identified as a landmark research infrastructure in the, the European landscape. Um, it, uh, its mission and aim is to provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond to digital language data in written, spoken, or multimodal form. Uh, advanced to, and to advance tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate, analyze, or combine them wherever, wherever they are located. This is also done um, in, 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 a, in a way that is compatible with the FAIR uh, principles and uh, uh, also via a single sign-on environment, which allows you to access this data uh, easily. It also uh, constitutes an ecosystem of knowledge sharing and training, and this is basically what we are doing here today. Uh, we are sharing our expertise and discussing uh, topics of relevance. And uh, it is also worth mentioning that uh, um, the uh, that Clarin is a part of the uh, SSH cluster or Social Cultural Innovation Cluster of Research Infrastructures in Europe, and uh, in that capacity, it is also integrated in the European Open Science Cloud, and it is a service provider 
to, to the EOS. So for instance, something like the transcription chain, we would like to hope uh, to be able to offer it as a service to beyond the humanities and social sciences. So um, from the practical point of view, Clarin is a consortium of uh, 22 members. Actually, as of January, we will uh, have a, a new observer. We have two observers now at the UK and South Africa, but we will have a new observer, Switzerland, uh, soon. And, uh, and then there's also centers located uh, outside of, of Europe, uh, in particular in the United States. It is a distributed network of data centers offering data and services that are uh, kind of harmonized and uh, more specifically, uh, the technical infrastructure of Clarin allows for the metadata from all uh, of these centers hosting various types of resources, among which oral archives, for instance, to uh, be searched centrally uh, via the Clarin Virtual Language Observatory, uh, which is a meta catalog that you can access to find out, for instance, about other resources that, uh, that Clarin hosts without having to know where uh, they are located. And uh, these, uh, uh, these resources can also uh, be um, explored or uh, further annotated uh, with uh, uh, the many uh, language resource services uh, that Clarin hosts and can be, that can be discovered by another centralized service, namely the Clarin uh, switchboard. Uh, all this constitutes, uh, as I said, an ecosystem for FAIR uh, data and services, namely uh, FAIR as in findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and following the principles uh, of uh, open science. Again, um, it is also a knowledge infrastructure with a network of knowledge centers uh, um, and various other initiatives that I'm not going to go in details here, uh, but you can address Clarin uh, with, uh, to, for support, for instance, over standards, uh, uh, to uh, get support for projects, uh, for data management plans, uh, to obtain funding uh, for mini projects such as the one that we are discussing here today. And then we have this collection of video, video channels and soon act, uh, also uh, we are actually improving on our collection of training materials and best practices papers, for instance. And then there's the uh, resource families. So uh, the resource families uh, were uh, an initiative created because uh, at times maybe the virtual language observatory, which contains, uh, uh, I think, millions of records can uh, be a bit uh, um, difficult to operate for newcomers. And uh, so the Clarin uh, resource families constitute like pre-compiled uh, overviews uh, of uh, language resources uh, uh, per data type. And we have now uh, 14 uh, resource, uh, resource families for corpora, six for lexical and conceptual resources, and four for tools. How do they look like? This is a, a snippet from the historical corpora resource family. And uh, there is one entry uh, from the list of uh, historical corpora that are available in Clarin. And this is how it looks like. So there's the name of the corpus, uh, which is a Dutch uh, corpus in this case, uh, from, with text from the 13th century. It, the, the size, uh, various useful metadata, that goes to the level of annotation, the license, and the download link will take you to the center which hosts uh, this uh, data. Uh, and the concordancer, when available, will take you to the place where you can actually access uh, the data via dedicated infra interface without having to uh, download. The. So, um, this is important, why? Because uh, the Ravensbrück project constitutes a new uh, proposal for, uh, for a resource family, um, which has been supported uh, with uh, the resource families uh, project funding, which is uh, available. So if you're interested, uh, uh, please take a look at these, uh, at these links. And uh, with, uh, with this uh, last remark, I think we can uh, continue uh, with uh, uh, our cafe, uh, so to say, the proper cafe. And therefore, I will uh, hand over to uh, stop sharing my screen and hand over to uh, Steph and Silvia for the first presentation.
So Steph may share uh, your screen. Your screen. Uh, unmute. Share screen. Share. Yes. And then we go to the slideshow. Uh, right. Let's start at the start. <laughs> yes, here we are. Hi there from the Netherlands. Um, together with Sylvia, uh, we will present our projects. <clears throat> Voices from Ravensbrück on the web, a multilingual challenge. We want to create a corpus that can be analyzed, approached from different perspectives. Um, this is a collaborative effort. So my name is Steph, I'm a digital historian. Sylvia is a social linguist. Um, Christoph Draxel, who is a, is a speech technologist. We have Henk from the Netherlands, Henk van Heuvel, who is a, a, a cur curatorial, who curates speech corpora. Uh, Arjan van Hesse is a phonetics. And together we have created this uh, resource platform, Speech and Tech. Um, it's in the slides. If you want to take a look, we explain in very simple ways how technology can be integrated in research that involves speech. So uh, if you're an oral historian or a qualitative analysis, go and have a look. Um, there's a lot to take. And the best of all is the transcription chain as developed by the Henk and Christoph and I. Um, but all this work would not have been possible without the help and support of all these people, which I'm not going to name, but they're listed there, so are included in the recording. Thank you very much to you all. Now, as a historian, I start with a situational context. What is Ravensbrück? Ravensbrück is a female-only camp located in the north of Berlin, and it used to be a re-education camp already before the start of the Second World War. Uh, so uh, petty criminals, sex workers, lesbians, lesbians communists were, were placed there, Jehovah Witness. And as the war started, and on the left, you can, on the right, you can see how Germany occupied the rest of Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, it started to include foreign populations, women, uh, resistance fighters, aid workers, prisoners of war. So it was a very heterogeneous group of people with Jewish people, religion, ethnicity, political views, and that makes it a very special camp. Um, it's, it, you, you see the numbers here, that's the number of people, of uh, women, men, the men were involved to build the camp, and a lot of children, and an estimate of 170,000 um, prisoners uh, were, were deceased, killed. It combined the worst of all camps. It had forced labor, medical experiments, beating, death marches, sexual abuse, gas campers, you name it. All the terrible things happened there. And um, it was liberated by the Soviet troops. And, um, and then the women returned home. What does it mean? It meant that um, survivors returned to their homes, to Eastern Europe, which was later, of course, separated from Western Europe. But they also emigrated to the United States, to Canada, to Israel. And here you see a photo of a very special um, footage in which a group of these people, of these women is welcomed in Sweden, in Malmo. It's a, it's a very beautiful film. And so it means they went back in quite different contexts. So decades later, when the memory boom started in the 80s, 90s, gradually women were 
passing away, were getting older, and the need was felt to preserve their memories with the help of technology. So in different parts of the world, um, projects were initiated. First, in analog form, you had audio and video creation, and they were created in different countries, funded by widely divergent organization, in different ways, with different metastata standards, and in different languages. As the web developed, they were made accessible, but also in very different ways. And, <clears throat> and this is a challenge to unite what is created in so many different ways. So why would you want to connect these different types of oral histories? Well, the reason we want to do that is because we want to learn from it. And what can you learn from it? The multilingual perspective is important, gender, coherence of themes and vocabulary. Are the questions that they are asked the same? Are the answers that they give the same? The different contexts of creation. We have private archives like the one Sylvia found, public institutions, researchers, journalists, video, audio, um, the different legal formats. Can you just download it? Can you share it? Can you go into it? That's very different. And sometimes it's it's culturally determined what the legal framework is. And um, of course, how are they made accessible? Metadata schemes, availability. Now, how can we do this? How can we bring this together? Well, we created a Clarin resource family. What is a clear and, and Clarin was so generous to fund this effort? What does it mean? It means a collection of sources that belong together and offer a kind of basis for exploration and research on a specific topic. And this is what we try to do heterogeneous populations look back on their lives, tell about their experiences. They're created in different contexts. When we compare them, what is similar and what is different? Well, how did it all start? Well, it started in Italy. And here my colleague Silvia will take over because she is the root of the whole project. Thank you, Steph, also for your kind words. Yeah, the story I, I, I would oh, like- Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I stopped. I need you. I still yes, need yes, you. yes, sorry. <laughs> But Sorry. anyway, there is no problem. A, uh, click exit. I, I can any, anyway start with words. Uh, just to tell you why it, all, it started from Italy. Uh, the starting point was uh, the finding of a, a, a very special treasure in a private house in, um, in Turin. We uh, discovered the oral archives uh, of Anna Maria Bruzzone, which was uh, almost neglected by academia. Um, Anna Maria Bruzzone, you can see here her, uh, her photo, uh, was a special researcher. She, she was a teacher working outside academia. And uh, she really has been a fascinating scholar working um, uh, in different ways with the hidden people from uh, history. She made interviews inside a psychiatric hospital with the female partisans and also with deportees from Havensbrück, together with her friend, uh, Lydia Beccaria Rolfi, who can, you can see in the photo as well. Um, they wrote together a book which was uh, published in 1978, but then has been uh, republished again one year uh, ago. And uh, uh, for that book, she collected uh, five interviews with uh, Italian survivors. Uh, the, the name are listed here, Lidia Beccaria Rolfi, Bianca Paganini Mori, Lidia, Olivia Borsi Rossi, and the sister Le, uh, Lina Baroncini Roveri and Nella Baroncini Poli. The interviews were uh, collected in uh, analog cassette uh, tapes uh, and uh, were hidden in a house in Turin. I discovered the, the, his treasure 
and uh, I found some money for the this digitization, and uh, I involved all my uh, friends from the speech and tech group, and uh, suggested the possibility to do to search for something like uh, this kind of uh, oral archive somewhere in other parts in, of the world. As for the Italian. Uh, archive, we, we transcribed it uh, verbatim and uh, we complemented uh, and described uh, the, the, all the interviews uh, according to the standard metadata scheme. Uh, and Enk, after my talk, will say something more in, detail, in, more in detail. And we found also that uh, since we are dealing with legacy data, uh, we, 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 we felt the necessity of adding some special field uh, to the CMDI uh, metadata scheme, that is context of creation and context of digitization, because we, we, we have to, uh, to offer all the, all the detailed information with respect to uh, how the archive has been created uh, in, an agolo, in an, uh, an analog form and how the archive has been digitized afterwards and how it's been treated uh, in a, uh, from a phil philological and archivist point of view. Uh, now, the data, the, the voices that were hidden uh, in Turin can be assessed uh, thanks to Clarin infrastructure, uh, via the language archive, thanks to Paul Trisbeck also, which I who I would like to thank for his great help. And here you can see all the metadata and uh, also the the files, uh, the audio files that can be accessed. So we are very very happy to share with you the work done also also by my students of sociolinguistics. Uh, uh, some of them are also present now, so it's important to say that it's really a collaborative effort from different point of view, from uh, students to teachers to uh, professors to technicians, so many, many people uh, that were involved in this uh, um, experience. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yes, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, oh, um, here uh, you can say you can see uh, some uh, orange flag, uh, which uh, represent all the other a part a, a selection of the others uh, of the other archives in which you can find interviews uh, about Havensburg. Um, you can see the different languages, the different type of archives and in institution from. A, private one, which, which is the video archive uh, Havensbruck uh, from Loretta Valls, and also very relevant and important archives and institutions like Shoah Visual, Visual History Archive, um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and also uh, Austrian Mediatek, and so on. Uh, all these uh, institutions were involved and answer our emails and uh, helped us in uh, finding uh, some interviews that were somehow uh, comparable to uh, those uh, that we found in, uh, in Italy. And uh, here you can see, uh, yeah, I, I, um, we, we also involved, uh, yes, the Ukrainian, I, I see a comment in the chat. Yes, we also involved the, the uh, Ukrainian archive uh, in Canada, but we still uh, didn't describe the, their uh, documentation yet. We, 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 we will, we hope that we will be able to, to do as soon as possible, but at present we are now describing uh, what we have already done uh, under this line of financial, uh, on financing. Anyway, um, all this work uh, show, uh, showed us also uh, some relevant issues that we try to, uh, I mean, not to solve, but anyway, to address uh, and um, to try to 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 put a, 
uh, under our attention. Um, they, they, they really mirror the complex realm of oral history. We, we do have um, interviews with different metadata schemes. We have a lot of interviews that are devoid of transcription. We have interviews that ha ha are devoid of summaries as well. Uh, we have uh, data uh, that cannot be shared um, in order to create transcription via our free automatic speech recognition tool and our uh, T-chain. We have also a complex relationship between the host institution, that is the archive, and the creator of interview. In some case, we, we do not have access to the details on how the project has been created and how the interviews has been uh, digitized, has been uh, run. In several cases, we do not have translations. And we, here we are facing the, the, the challenges of a, a true uh, multilingual resources because uh, Ravensbrück Canto was really a bubble uh, uh, of languages as the, the, the deputies uh, tell in, in their interviews. In addition, uh, in many cases, account is required to get access to metadata, not only to the interviews, but also to, to the metadata. So uh, in some cases, it's a long, uh, uh, a long path to, to, to reach in order to have the, the documentation. And in several cases, also access is bound to license because the project uh, needs revenues. So you, you, you see just a list of all the, the difficulties that we have, that we faced, uh, uh, not to mention the, dif the differences in the quality in the style of, of interviews that were, that uh, make also the comparison between the interviews uh, themselves uh, rather difficult. But anyway, uh, next slide, please. It is worthwhile. Uh, we believe that everything uh, in this respect is really worthwhile because we, we can do a lot of research from very, very different points of view. Um, you can look at the din linguistic dynamics of, and uh, communication strategies. Um, you can explore and compare these uh, languages used uh, by the majority of the camp population. They were Polish or German and those used by the minority, minorities, for instance, Italian and Dutch. But you can also uh, investigate the nonverbal communication in oral history and in video oral history. For instance, you can ask whether nonverbal features of interviews conducted with women are somehow universal or somehow linguistic specific or cultural specific. You can investigate silence and pause and different speech rates uh, in different interviews uttered in different languages. You can look at LOFER, for instance, and verify whether there are some common features uh, uh, regardless of the language uh, languages spoken. You can also compare the, the geneal genealogy of oral history interviews. <coughs> for instance, you can ask, uh, who has an interest in documenting this experience and when and how did the project evolve and how and why they are founded. And finally, you can also investigate the narrative styles in testimonies of women survivors. For instance, you can ask whether women have something specific and universal in the way they give testimony of trauma if compared, for instance, to uh, male narratives. So there is a lot of things to do and uh, we are just uh, at the beginning, not at the end of our research experience and research project. And now I um, give the floor to um, Hank van den Heuvel, who will describe a little bit more in detail the uh, aspects uh, relating to the metadata scheme that we used. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, yes, I will share my screen as well. 
So I think you see my uh, slides here, at least my first slide, um, um, which is... Um, 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 can you please just um, um, enlarge it a little, yeah. like a slideshow? Uh, yeah, slideshow, exactly. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, the problem is then at, at this point, I can't see my own uh, uh, taps anymore. <laughs> so uh, perhaps I should not do it like that. Well, we just see how it works. OK, so CMDI, uh, a closer look at the Claire metadata scheme. What I hope is at the end of my talk, you know what a, what a CMDI uh, stands for, what it is. Um, then how, how we used it for this uh, project uh, as a metadata scheme, and perhaps also how you could use it yourself in your own projects, uh, which could, of course, be very uh, valuable as well. So let me just pick on uh, one of the slides that uh, uh, Steph and Sylvia just showed. So what we see here is uh, 38 Ravensbrück interviews from all over Europe, as you, as you see, and these, this is part of this Ravensbrück uh, resource family. Um, so a resource family, as already explained by Francesca, is a, a, a specific guidance that Clarin offers uh, to um, uh, show users of Clarin uh, a way to specific topics in, 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 in all the material that they have. Um, if I would click here, you would probably see this is the, the main page of, um, of the resource families. Um, and you can see, uh, if you go down, here are the corpora, the ones, uh, and the lexica and the tools. And um, this month, um, the oral history uh, corpora will also be added. Uh, we're on the verge of publishing it together with, uh, with Clarin. And it will then be one of these, uh, of these pages. So how will it look like? Uh, this is the, the landing page that we have constructed. So it's a bit smallish, I think. Maybe I can enlarge it for you. Um, so it will contain uh, some information about the Clarin Resource Family for Oral History, what it is. Um, it will more specifically detail the Ravensbrück Oral History Resource Family, with these, which are these 38 files, uh, uh, interviews, which I mentioned. Uh, and of course, which of the Brutzone uh, four interviews is an, an important part. Okay, you also see here a, a paragraph about CMDI, uh, because we think it's important that you as users and uh, of, of this specific oral history resource family know what, what the metadata entails. Um, so the CMDI is a, uh, an abbreviation for component metadata infrastructure. You can find all information on this page, uh, which is part of, um, of the Claren um, uh, website. And if you go down, you see here uh, the component uh, registry. And here you can see all these profiles. And one of the profiles that we um, uh, devised was one for oral history interviews. I can type it here. Uh, and this is the specific one we are now looking at for the Claren Resource family, the oral history interview uh, profile, which was derived from the one just above, uh, but it had some extras. So if I click it here, you'll see how it looks like. Um, it has a, an element for, for the ID, a description of the interview, and here you can see the uh, component structure because it's hierarchical. If I now just click this one, you see that um, this um, a component interview generals built up of several other elements like number of speakers, creation date, publication date, duration, owner. So it's a lot of information that you can add there um, amongst also creation content. And if we go down, we go further and we see new components popping up. And here, for example, you have interview content, and it says which is the language, uh, the coverage, temporal, spatial, does it have a full transcript, what are the keywords, and so on. So uh, this gives a, a, a hierarchical overview of all the metadata, and which can be used for uh, interviews. And so we did for our specific um, um, oral history Ravensbrück uh, collection. Okay, 
So what made them uh, specific uh, compared to the previous one for oral history interview is that we added creation context. So how, what, what are the circumstances in which the interview was created? We thought this would be a specific thing that is relevant for oral historians uh, to add. The digitization context. So how did it come from, for example, analog to digital? And does it contain a full transcript? Uh, people would like to know that beforehand if they, if they, before they start looking into the, uh, um, into the recording. And then um, what we also uh, added is an extensive description of um, all these uh, elements. So if you're here, you see uh, a part of our landing page will be a description of the component and its elements, which I can click here. Um, and then um, you will be helped and guided through this specific CMDI for oral history. So we get some information here, and most of it, which I just told you. And then here for each of the elements, you get an explanation of how to use it if you would like to use it yourself. All right, so let's move on. Next step, it's a, it's a short ride in a fast machine. Um, and I hope I won't confuse you. Um, um. Next step. So we have set up the profile and now we had to fill um, the profile with the information for the individual interviews. Um, so for that, we go to the uh, Comedi metadata editor, which is also part of the Claren infrastructure built by our colleagues in Norway. And it gives you an excellent way of using such a profile in a user-friendly way of adding and entering the information for each metadata element in your profile. So if we uh, would go there, um, just click it. And here, uh, let me see, we go to the records. And um, let me see, I, I will just go to the ones that we had for. So here you will see a, an enormous set of metadata records according to our new own profile for each of the interviews in our Ravensbrück oral history collection. And here you see the Brutsonian ones, yes? So uh, we could go to uh, Lydia, we mentioned her earlier. And here you see uh, everything that we entered for her in this profile. You see here also Lydia Beccaro Rolfi um, uh, and with the descriptions, we give the digitization context. Here you have the creation context and all the information that we mentioned before. We have a summary of each of the intervals that, uh, that we have. So it's extensive in its summary. We do have the transcriptions as well and so on. So this is, uh, this is really a great work, I think, um, and it's very relevant for, for the community. So once we had done that, we had um, put the information into the Comedi, and the next step was to download it, the metadata records of all these interviews, and copy them and give them a self-link and put them in our point where the uh, metadata could be harvested and harvested so by the Claren infrastructure that they would end up in the virtual language observatory. So let me click this one as well. So this is Clarence, a virtual language observatory. And here you can look for all the data, um, the, the, the materials, the resources, the data resources that um, have metadata and can be obtained via Claren. So here, if I go here, um, then, for example, I would look for a uh, Brutzone. Let's see what happens. And here we are. It's the Anna Maria Brutzone Ravensbrück interviews. I click them here. Um, and where we uh, get now is at the language archive for Paul Trilsbeck. Uh, I think he's here. Welcome, Paul. Um, so here you have the full uh, collection with the interviews, and you can go to here to um, the language archive and have them all. Uh, four interviews, they are here and you can click them individually and go to that interview. And when you look at the description here, for again, for Bianca or Lydia, you see at the end uh, a persistent identifier. 
And that persistent identifier will uh, bring you, um, but it, it's also in the virtual language observatory, but just to have the connections there, will bring you to, I'll click it here, um, will bring you to the uh, metadata, uh, that, that the rich metadata with creation, context, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, but it will be a much better view in the virtual language observatory, of course. Um, so these are all the steps. Um, everything is uh, to be published. And um, I think and I hope that this presentation gives you an idea of how you can work with the uh, component metadata infrastructure that Claren offers. And maybe it's also interesting for your own uh, work. Uh, but certainly, if you are active in the oral history field, I think uh, this is a very worthwhile uh, profile uh, to, um, to use. And if you would like to do it and you have inf uh, questions on how to do it, you can always approach me. I would be happy to help you with that. Thank you. That was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hank. That is, was very, very clear. And indeed, uh, it also puts even more uh, clearly uh, the project in the context of the Clarin infrastructure. Uh, I think we can continue with uh, now uh, the presentation of Christoph Drexler uh, uh, on the transcription chain. Okay. So two words uh, before. I start. I'm from the Phonetics Institute in Munich, and what I'm going to present now is some ongoing work. So uh, the demo might work very well, but you might feel some or see some problems when using it every day. Originally, when we started developing tools, we had the phonetic community in mind, and they always have the same kind of short sentences with some particular words in there. Ich habe gepupe gesagt, ich habe gepiepe gesagt, and then they look for the fine, tiny differences. And then came oral history people with interviews of three hours in length, four hours in length, with different participants, and we wanted to pre uh, deal with them so this was we needed a lot of discussions on both sides how can we reduce complexity and how can we improve technology and this is one of the results it is one of the several ways that exist today to get to support part of the transcription project uh, prog uh, process transcription process and everybody is afraid of having to do transcriptions and we try to offer a few different ways of doing it and this one the one I'm going to show you now is a very simple one. You have very little options, but you don't have to care about these options. So everything is pre-configured and there are some other ways of doing it, but I will present today uh, the transcription portal. So when you open the page, I will later I'll put the link in the, in the chat. The first thing you see is one, two, three in your browser and then you need in your operating system some audio files which must be in WAV format which you can drop on the page here. Oops. Let's do this manually. Okay. Now these are file these files are being uploaded to the server and you go to the verify step. In this case, these are all German recordings. I selected short recordings for the demo. You have a number of uh, third-party speech recognition services available. We were lucky to get a very substantial grant from IBM to use their uh, speech recognizer. We are very happy that Radboud University provides us with some speech recognition. We also can use the, make use of the Google Cloud platform. We all we have some free uh, quotas with most of these systems. Until now, we only rely on free services. But if you need more of these capacities, you can buy for some of these providers. You can buy an access key that allows you to do more processing. I will stick with the demo today. We can add new languages here. At the moment, we have uh, German, English, Dutch, and 
there sh should be one more, Ita of course, Italian. And uh, when you click on the logo of the provider, you can see the uh, requirements or the fundamental parts of the uh, agreement of using it because you have to be aware some of these providers keep the data that you give them. With IBM, this is at the moment not the case. So then you select the things you want to uh, be applied to your data. In this case, I want to do speech recognition and then I want to do a manual transcription because as we all know, automatic transcription does not work very well or in some parts it works well, but you will always have to correct it. I skip the word alignment and phonetic detail, although in the presentation of a few minutes ago when uh, Silvia talked about starting to do analysis of speech pauses and speech rate and so on, this would be quite interesting as well, but I'll skip it for now. Okay, this is organized like a spreadsheet. We have the different tasks, uploading the data, performing speech recognition, performing the manual transcription, and the, you will see check marks walking through the diagram. So they've been uploaded. Oops, and speech recognition did not work, probably because I did not register as a user. This is unexpected, but my, probably simply my, uh, okay, now I'm getting confused, <laughs> sorry. The reason is that Yes, I forgot this. So I forgot my Clarine login. Now I en entered the login, the files are being processed. And it will be hopefully rather short processing time. Maybe while we wait, I wanted to um, yeah, underline the fact that uh, this uh, sign on, single sign on that I was speaking about yes. in production is exactly what Christoph just did. And all of you that are based in a Clarin member country are have access uh, with their, your academic uh, interventions to this. Thank you for this. Yes, exactly. We need one, only one uh, academic account, and then we can log in. You can always see what's happened so far. So have a look at these uh, at these check marks. And for example, to view the transcript of ASR, you can see here, now we get the text. This is about one minute from a German parliamentary speech. You can download it immediately if you want, or you can do a manual annotation in, in the browser as well. So here you have the options to do classical transcription. And when you're done, I'm not changing anything now. You have different options in this editor. You send it back and you can see that now also this has been done. And in the end, you can download your data in a number of formats, depending on what you need. There were some suggestions to make this page less technical because now we're you can see only the format names and not the purpose for which for which these files can be used we're working on this so hopefully we will have an example of where these formats can be used let me tell you now that if you export your, for example your file in a table format you can immediately start to do statistical analysis for example, word counts and so on. If you also do a phonetic segmentation, you can also do some in-depth uh, analysis of the spoken language as it is. So you can have a look at pause length and speech rate. And if you would like to simply add subtitles to your audio, there are formats here available. And you can do this, you can select them individually or simply click on get package and then everything will be downloaded at once. So we try to make everything as simple as possible. Of course, there are some limitations. We only have a limited number of 
uh, ASR services available and some of them may not be available all the time or when the quota for a month has been exceeded we have to wait uh, until the next month month begins uh, the second thing is at the moment we allow only wave formatted files and they must be mono files so only one channel at a time we're working on this to allow more formats or to do some more signal processing within uh, the tool and finally yes if you have any problems or so with the page there is a feedback button this will go directly to our developers so then we know what did not work and feel free to use this because that's the only way we get feedback from you and can improve the service thank you Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. This was really interesting. I was not uh, up to date with the latest developments. It's uh, really, really impressive. Uh, so, uh, and indeed, it shows this collaboration that uh, that has started uh, a while ago within Claren between uh, uh, speech technologies and the oral history uh, community. Uh, now there will be a, a next presentation, a lesson, lesson in troubleshooting, how to integrate oral history data in the Claren ecosystem. I think it's uh, um, uh, Fabio uh, who is going to... Yeah. Um, Francesca, we decided to, to skip that part in order to give more space to the, to the discussion. So uh, Fabio will describe his experience and then you... you we will go on with that line. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening to everyone. And thank you for inviting me to contribute to this panel. Well, as Silvia said, my brief input to this discussion uh, regards my experience of transcriber of the Italian interviews by Anna Maria Bruzzone. Uh, first thing I would like to say is that I approached this assignment uh, having a linguistic background. So I would like to point out how linguistics can contribute to realizing faithful transcriptions and uh, what legacy data means for linguistic research. Uh, evidently, confronting uh, recorded voices uh, means to deal with the diachronically defined uh, linguistic varieties, uh, or in other words, with uh, language statuses uh, considerably distinct from the contemporary ones. Uh, also in oral documents collected a few decades ago, like the one uh, composing uh, the Bruxelles archive. Um, to be clear, the possibility to have a direct representation of a past language status is at the basis of the enormous uh, value that uh, legacy data have in linguistic studies, uh, although it produces uh, evidently some issues uh, to be accounted. Um, these diachronic discontinuities, in fact, uh, may in some cases generate ambiguities, uh, especially in degraded audio or in segments not easily intelligible. Uh, an example of all, uh, the interview is often uh, produced uh, a word, uh, gamela, that probably is no longer part of the competence of a typical Italian speaker. Uh, they mean a metal container for food or beverage, the gamella. Uh, that after a phonetic weakening typical of the Northern Italian dialects uh, become gamela. So we are in presence of a double complication, uh, a rural lexical unity uh, affected by a form of phonetic shift uh, toward uh, a dialectal form. Uh, it is something that evidently creates a problem for automatic speech recognition, uh, but that can be successfully disambiguated by the human intervention. Uh, symmetrically, if the idea is that transcribed audios can serve as databases for the training of automatic recognition, uh, then human review with transcriptions can be a precious resource in augmenting the performances of uh, transcription chains, like uh, the one successfully adopted for this uh, project. A last point, uh, the emotional content on, on these interviews. Uh, having heard all the materials of the archive, uh, I tangibly experienced the amount of emotive content uh, that it conveys, a content that cannot be in any case featured in written texts, and uh, that the publication of the original voices will give back to all the potential beneficiaries. Uh, from this perspective, uh, the participation of this project represents for me a particular reason of satisfaction and, of course, uh, of gratitude for uh, uh, all the speech and tech group. I concluded. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Fabio, for this uh, uh, feedback. And uh, uh, I think that now we can open the discussion, but uh, we will open it with uh, uh, another short intervention by Yulia Chernyshova and Alessandra uh, and Alessandra Carbone. Thank you very much, Francesca. I just share my screen. Okay. So, do you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. My name is Yulia Chernyshova, and uh, I'm now a visiting professor at the University of Siena. Uh, I was um, an also um, a professor of uh, Kiev National University, Taras Shevchenko. And as I have arrived uh, in Italy uh, on March, 2022 because of the war between Russia and my country, Ukraine. And I had the honor to be kindly invited by um, the University of Siena. I've got acquainted with uh, Professor Silvia Kalamai and with the project uh, Voices of uh, Ravensbrück. I have studied uh, to do some um, small researches about uh, Russian, Ukrainian and Polish archives. And I would like uh, with uh, Alessandra Carbone to present to you the first uh, small results of these scanning phases as um, even if partial, they still uh, could be the first step in um, involving the Slavic voices in the project and implementing the expansion of a multilingual collection of interviews held with the survivors of uh, Ravensbrück as in that camp, uh, women from all corners of uh, Europe, including Soviet Union and uh, Poland were deported. So um, the stories of Slavic women are collected and uh, preserved in many different ways. As the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine persists, we are concentrating now on the web, on the resources which are now accessible through the web, hoping we can safely return in Ukraine soon. So archives located in Ukraine, the State Archive of the Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance is an institution where the documents of the secret police, special services and other repressive bodies of the communist and national socialist totalitarian regimes are collected. And where could be oral interrogations of former Ravensbrück prisoners considered criminals. So they are in Ukrainian and they are in Ukraine. Then website, uh, Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance, the sections uh, online archive of oral story and the uh, Ukrainian Second World War, whose activities are coordinated by the cabinet of uh, ministers of Ukraine across the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy, and realizes the state policy in conserving and uh, reconstruction of the Ukrainian people's memory. Uh, this archive is in Ukraine and in Ukrainian. Archives located in the European Union. Archive uh, witnessing genocide experiences of Nazi concentration camps of the Polish Research in Institute of Lund Universitet. It contains uh, video interviews in Polish uh, brought to Sweden by survivors of uh, Ravensbrück and material that the Polish uh, Re Research Institute compiled as reference resources. They are in Sweden. Polish archive Fundacja na Rzecz Kobiet, uh, uh, oral interviews in Polish. Polish archive, uh, Polish community family of female prisoners of the Ravensbrück German concentration camp in Polish, and testimonies of former Ravensbrück prisoners on the website Chronicles of Terror in Polish. Archives located in Canada, Archive of the Ukrainian Canadian Research and uh, Documentation Center, 
Uh, it's a resource center which holds oral histories in audio and video formats, many digitized. We have already got in touch with the director of this center, Dr. Iroida Vinnitska, and we have launched a collaboration. So I would like to thank a lot uh, Iroida Vinnitska for her interest to collaborate with us. And I see now uh, here with us, uh, Christine Eliashevska, Irina Marchuk, Oksana Marchuk, uh, Kalina Butler, um, all of them from uh, Canada, probably somebody else. Um, so I thank you very much for your interest and for your participation. Archives located in the USA, USA Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive Online that contains uh, 32 interviews in Russian, one in Ukrainian, 57 in Polish, all of survivors and the witnesses of genocide in Ravensbrück. Uh, these are all uh, resources waiting for different scholars. Uh, now I give the floor to Alessandra Carbone and invite uh, her to present uh, Russian archives and uh, various um, initiatives that we are um, going to, uh, to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me. Uh, I am Alessandra. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everybody, too, for having us. Uh, my name is Alessandra Carbone. I teach Russian language and literature at University of Siena, so I collaborate with Silvia Calamai, and I have we have the honor to have Julia Chernyshova to join us in the University of Siena for this research period. Uh, so I was involved, too, in this project. My uh, role uh, is... Uh, uh, a little role in uh, by now, but I would like to continue the speech of Yulia uh, about her research uh, um, about archives uh, that contain material, oral material in Slavic uh, in Slavic languages, because we have some by now little but some interesting uh, archives who have ma oral material in Russian. Uh, we have the project Tastarana. Uh, or a history of war prisoners. Tastarana in Russian means uh, that side. Uh, it has. Uh, uh, it is a Russian, uh, a Russian uh, association, who has interesting materials about oral interviews of women prisoners in Russian language and Ukrainian too, and uh, which are available thanks to the project uh, uh, Memorial. Uh, the uh, Memorial Russia. The materials uh, and the transcriptions and the videos uh, belong, uh, in fact, to the Association Memorial, uh, who is now um, considered a foreign agent in uh, present Russia, who has been shut down and closed in present Russia, but they continue, of course, work uh, in uh, other, other uh, countries uh, now in Europe, for example, and they won the Nobel Prize, the Peace Nobel Prize uh, 2022. They have all this material. We have uh, the archive and uh, the material and uh, Russian video uh, and video memories of the um, former prisoners. Then we can have the next one, please. We have the interview archive, Zvang Zarbait, 1939-1945. Uh, 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 it's a joint uh, initiative uh, from Fund Erinnerung, uh, Ferrand Fortung and Zugfund uh, and the Freie Universität Berlin. We have found here 12 interviews taken from former Ravensbrück prisoners. Oh, yeah, because I am talking, uh, we are talking about only Ravensbrück prisoners because they have a lot of material about uh, some other camps and working camps. But now I'm talking just about Ravensbrück uh, prisoners materials. The records uh, are both in Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, we obtain 64 results uh, uh, if we search um, through the keyword Ravensbrück, and we have a lot of languages, but uh, uh, we have a lot of hours of video in Russian and uh, Ukrainian too. 
so we have we will have to do a punctual scanning and translation and transcription and commenting of these uh, materials and next one Julia please and then we have this Julia find found this documentary film it is a Soviet film in 1984 it was uh, 1984, it is an interesting data date. The uh, movie is called Jenshine is Ravinsbruka, Women from Ravensbrück. And uh, okay, it's a documentary film. Uh, women survivors from Ravensbrück camp were interviewed, but even if the material and the stories seem very interesting, of course, it's Soviet Russia. So the whole experience is staged. The former prisoners were prepared. There are a lot of uh, rhetorical moments uh, and uh, the spontaneous uh, discourse is just not existing here. And also the choice of these former prisoners is uh, very interesting because they choose to interview only uh, volunteers who volunteered to go to war only partisan, only members of Communist Party. So, uh, of course, we cannot trust uh, everything here. And there is no spontaneous, really actual oral uh, discourse there. And it has the same structure of a book who was published in 1961, uh, Anipa Bidili uh, which would be uh, They Want Death, which is an experience, a book about uh, the memories of these former prisoners from Ravensbrück. Uh, next one, please. Uh, about uh, the project of Dr. Professor Yulia Chernyshova, uh, we have two uh, projects uh, that we have submitted and we are waiting for results. Slavic Equals from Ravensbrück slide, the European Commission's Marie uh, Kuris Lodowska action, and we are now waiting for results. And also uh, the project that Ravensbrück a Kiev from Ravensbrück to Kiev, um, we submitted to Academia del Lincei, the Lentian Academy, which is a very prestigious academy in Italy. And next one, please. Uh, about Slavic Eagles from Ravensbrück, the project would be offering a detailed census of the interviews uh, and Dr. Yulia Chernyshova uh, and the team uh, uh, will work about describing a selection of interviews according to the CM CMDI metadata scheme, as we saw before connecting the output of the second uh, point to the recently born corpus resource family called oral history uh, in declaring Eric, of course, infrastructure and transcribing a selection of interviews in order to compare Slavic voices, uh, Ukrainian, Russian and Polish with the Italian ones. And uh, next one slide. The final one, we have a, a little event to come in our campus in Arezzo, the inauguration of an exhibition, uh, an, exhibi an exhibition about Andrei Sakharov, human rights in the heart of Europe, in collaboration with Memorial, the association Memorial I mm, talked about before, and the EU Parliament, uh, who um, it, uh, <coughs> collaborate to, um, with Memorial. And we will have uh, uh, Amber Laurenzi, the president of the Association Women for Ravensbrook, the professor Giulia De Florio, Memorial Italia, and uh, who teaches at University in Parma. Uh, me, Professor Yulia Chernyshov, of course, uh, will, uh, who will uh, illustrate the project Slavic Hikers from Ravensbrook. And the date is uh, January 11th uh, in Arezzo. Uh, the, uh, it will be, of course, in our campus, but it will be an open event. We will uh, do the streaming, uh, so uh, everyone is invited, of course. And we have finished it. Thank you very much for your attention. Next slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you for this uh, very, very interesting uh, new development, uh, I would say, of, of this project. So I, I, can I call it a spin-off? And I cannot, I guess that there is no need for me to underline how important this is, uh, both from the historical point of view and also from the contemporary point of view in, uh, in the context that we live in. And uh, so uh, we're really happy that, uh, that this could, uh, could happen. Uh, I can say that, yeah, this is a long story because uh, Sylvia and I uh, first uh, attended a, 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 a workshop dedicated to oral history in, in Oxford um, 
some, some time ago, I think seven years ago already. And then uh, some of these topics uh, were, had, were already kind of boiling up, but uh, things have uh, progressed uh, quite a bit. And uh, I think that uh, we can open the discussion. Um, I see that... Uh, uh, there are maybe also people uh, who are affiliated to our fellow research infrastructure, IRI, um, uh, from the Holocaust Research Infrastructure. So maybe they have uh, some questions as to also how to make our uh, records uh, intercompa intercompatible. And uh, maybe others have also interesting questions. Uh, there is one in chat already. Um, May uh, I, if Maria wants to open up the microphone, uh, please go ahead and uh, ask your question uh, live. Otherwise, I can read it myself. Sure. Thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, my question has to do uh, with the more technical side of the transcription portal. So I was wondering, should we be worried when using the transcription portal um, um, that if we are using large files, we are going to reduce other users' ability to use the service, or does every user get their own um, individual fraction of the freely available quota? Thank you. No, it's, unfortunately, it's for all of them who are available, uh, for all the users at the same time, so we have one big quota. But for some services, there is, as I said before, an option to buy an access key. We don't, don't earn anything from this. We simply pass on the invoice to you when this is done. So this is an option to get around this quota. This is available for uh, the Google service. But at the moment, the IBM quota is very generous. So we can try and exploit that. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, and you can have a look when you selecting the uh, the service. You should see in the green or yellow or red button how much of the quota is left. So I, I assume this will lead to everybody doing their transcription work early in December or early in the month, and then <laughs> uh, fine tuning the annotations. But at the moment, this is the situation. We do not have publicly available, really powerful. Uh, ASR for all the languages. However, from for Dutch and for English, we do have uh, support from Radboud. So there is a good, there's good news too. Thank you so much. This is very useful to know because I'm recommending the service to many people, and I'm worried that <laughs> you know they're going to. You know, take yes, in a way, it. if you recommend it to other people, you're taking away part of what you can process. So that's a, a bit of an unfortunate situation. <laughs> Thank you. I will um, ask them to use it moder with moderation. You know. Yes, I always suggest do a short test beforehand because there are very high expectations of ASR. And when you see the results, especially for historical recordings, for recordings with strong dialect, recordings with uh, many participants, it will be easier to do the transcription right from scratch right away. So if you're word error rate is more than about 20%, which very often is the case for oral history, it does not pay to use ASR, then it's better to, to do it manually right from the start. So Thank give it a try with a few minutes, see how good it works, and then decide on how to proceed. Thank you. Uh, I think that, yeah, that this was very useful also from the practical point of view. Uh, there is another question. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Please go ahead, Ma uh, Maffeld. Uh. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for this nice introduction to Clarin. I'm currently running a project um, gathering interviews uh, with people uh, from Ukraine who uh, were displaced as a result of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and our data protection officer wants us to care to take care of this uh, sensitive data in a special manner and I have the feeling I'm just asking a couple of questions that were raised and that have the feeling that for that reason I could not potentially use Clarin but I would like to ask for clarification so on the level of the standardized metadata to, am I correct that there is um, no possibility to offer different users profile and to make sure that the data can be archived with a pseudonym and that different access can be given so some people can give access can, can get access to only the pseudonym 
pseudonymed version of a transcript, for example, or only to uh, the um, um, to a different kind of the audio version where personal data are uh, kept out. Uh, on the level of transcription, am I right that you uh, first have to upload the transcript online on the internet, or is it also possible that you install Clarin on your server and you actually work digitally but without accessing uh, the internet? Um, and then I had a question about yeah a collective group environment. So how is it possible to work in a um, like in a, in a way that that that, that um, um, guarantees or um, 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 this data protection uh, standards uh, of the GDPR when working together in an international group together in one central database? And the last question is: Do you offer two-factor identification before people log in to um, Clarin? Thank you very much. Maybe I can just say a few words. Uh, so Clarin is distributed infrastructure. So in a way, uh, the uh, the individual centers at which data is stored are responsible also for the access policy. But in general, yes, it is possible to uh, give different types of access based on identification. Uh, and for the other questions, maybe Silvia, uh, Christoph, and Hank want uh, to take different parts uh, of it, uh, uh, maybe. I can say something about legal issues. Um, thank you for your many questions, let's say, at, the, at very different levels. So I, I, I just start with um, a tentative answer. Um, I can uh, describe my experience with uh, Italian data. We decide to uh, give, obviously, metadata in a uh, totally open uh, access, whereas the audio file and then in the transcription can be accessed by, by a single sign-on. And uh, uh, in the TLA, they have a restricted label access. So you, you, you can decide on what level and what kind of access you can give according to the license that Clarin offer, offers to you. In case of deputies, the case of deputies, I think, are rather different from what you are doing now at present. So uh, in our case, in deputies were uh, known with their names and first name and, and, and surname. So they were already public figures. Uh, they were already known people. Uh, and we involved also uh, their next of kin. We asked uh, the permission to uh, sons and relatives that we uh, know know that they are still alive. So we have all the permissions to uh, distribute and to make uh, this story as part of a European story. So I, I think that what you are doing is uh, not exactly comparable on to what we, we, we did uh, with this kind of uh, legacy data. Um, anyway, inside Clarin, there is a Clarin Legal Issue Committee that, uh, um, it, that is made by several people from different countries, and they also answer to specific questions, uh, specific uh, points um, according to European and national laws. So I think that it could be a knowledge center that can be uh, asked uh, for uh, further uh, information. I think yeah, there was also the question about uh, um, yeah whether you can run the transcription chain, right? Uh, was that the question on um, on your own server or machine? Maybe this is uh, for Christoph to answer. Yes, I can say something here. The transcription chain at the moment, no, it's not possible uh, because it's a No, <laughs> to make yeah. it simple, we can't do it at the moment. Uh, the sec but there is an option if you uh, use the built-in editor, which you just saw in, in the last minute of my presentation, you can use this editor. You have to open the editor once in your web browser, and then you can use it like any other local software. And it is up to you whether you access the uh, internet or not. So if you go to the 
option of using ASR within the editor, then your file gets uploaded, but you can use it completely locally, just like you would uh, use any other editor and does, it does not communicate with the internet after the page has been loaded. So you can use the basic transcription editor without any problems, without any data leaving your machine. If you want to use ASR or the phonetic tools, data will go somewhere else for the tools that we offer uh, from the Phonetics Institute. We can guarantee that the data is only seen by machines. It stays in the European Union, so it stays in Munich. Uh, for ASR, we cannot guarantee this because we have providers which uh, we have services provided by American companies and we do not know where they put the data. So three answers basically, if you want to do only transcription, you don't need the internet except for downloading the editor. If you use any of the other tools provided by the Phonetics Institute, data stays in Europe, we will delete it after a given number of hours and the data is safe even from our own uh, people at the Institute. And if you use external services like ASR, you have to accept the terms of usage. Res with respect to anonymization or pseudonymization, we have a web service that also allows you to uh, anonymize the audio recording. So you give it a list of words that you do not want to see in the, in the audio file. And uh, then in combination with the automatic segmentation service that is available, it will delete all these uh, parts of the signal or it will override these parts of the signal uh, by some noise, which makes it impossible to retrieve the content. So actually it's not overwriting, but it's replacing part of the signal with some noise so that you do not have any trace of what was there before. So there is a service, you can contact me for details. And I think it's also, it's also the case that for each uh, automatic speech recognizer, it's indicated uh, uh, who the provider is and what the terms of use are. So it's not just a blind guess. Uh, so you can see whether or not you would, um, uh, whether or not the data will go to, to some other place and may stay there, I think. Um, and the other thing is, of course, which language you would like to have uh, the transcriptions, uh, um, because there should be a, a speech recognizer for your language. Uh, maybe Steph wanted to ask add something as well. Yeah, uh, now I'm unmuted. I, I wanted to point um, Nachtel to, I think in 2013, we had a conference um, at the Rasmus University called Digital Testimonies of War and Trauma. And there was a group of Slavists who came to our conference. I forgot their name. Um, and they had a special arrangement. They collected live interviews from Chechenia during the Chechenian war with Russia. And they had a special server where they, where they kept these interviews because, of course, they were afraid of having them in the United States. So um, I, I can retrieve the program from that um, from that event, and then you can get the name. Yeah, indeed, I think that also the Clarion infrastructure is constantly evolving and, and sharpening its its toolbox. So um, within the broader domain of the EOSC, for instance, there are projects that are dealing with these issues. Uh, so the European Open Science Cloud, so that as to allow, uh, for instance. Uh, um, web services to go to the data rather than uh, data to go to the web services. I, I am not quite uh, sure I could explain how this works, but uh, just to say that these are known issues and it, it, in, in, a, in our research infrastructure such and as well as others, it is possible that we will find technical solutions uh, to deal with this problem. So it is also very important um, that we discuss as we are doing today uh, with uh, uh, people who have specific needs uh, so that we can keep them in mind as we uh, progress. Um, any other any other questions, remarks, uh, comments? 
Yes, maybe I just as an add on, um, uh, because I know that you are interested in automatic um, uh, speech recognition for Ukrainian. Um, the software we are using right now is Happy Scribe. You have to pay for it, but it's the one that progressed the most over the course of the last six months. And it's really astonishing where they were six months ago and where they are right now. So this is a field very, very much in flux. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, my another question that I was uh, uh, asking at the beginning was whether, um, yeah, it, it, it would be possible. So for instance, the work of uh, Julia and Alessandra have, has shown that there are already very many archives out there and uh, they, uh, their metadata have potentially also been harvested by other initiatives. Uh, how can we try to make uh, um, them visible uh, uh, to all of those that uh, for 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 whom they are relevant? And uh, I don't know whether um, there is someone from uh, the Holocaust research infrastructure here if they want to say something about uh, their own uh, work in this respect. maybe they disconnected so i anyway um just for those who do not are not familiar with this i will just put the link in the chat <clears throat> thank you very much and maybe uh Martel, uh if you could just repeat the name of the software uh it would be very interesting sorry i didn't catch Thank you very much, both. Thank you. Maybe I have also um, some curiosities. Um, so first of all, uh, one uh, for Christophe. Um, do you think that it is, um, I mean, Running the transcription chain at your institution, so you 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 have uh, grants uh, uh, that support you. But uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, would it make sense to clone the transcription chain? So uh, and would it help to make it more sustainable uh, while ho by hosting it uh, also on, on other um, nodes? Or the bottleneck is really uh, with the capacity of the individual. Uh, um, services uh, that are anyway run from elsewhere? The limiting factor is people. Uh, we cannot provide any support. So if you have someone who is technologically savvy any per in a permanent position, uh, we can make this, of course, available. But even our we as an institute cannot have no guarantee that this service will be available because of the usual university uh, employment rules so it's a it's a problem here so as long as i am at the institute the service will be here which will be another few more years but we have to look at a long-term solution yes yeah, this is also already been discussed also within uh, within Claren. Yes, it's it's <laughs> the same everywhere. It, it, as soon as it becomes a service, you really and as soon as you offer it to the outside world, you have to make sure that it stays. And this is something that basically libraries or archives or other institutions can provide. But for them, all of this technical processing is rather new. So, yes, we have to see how what direction the discussion will go. And maybe another question is, uh, so how much, uh, I mean, how, how much of this would have been possible without Klein, what you did uh, in a way? <laughs> so because we're trying, this is this question is uh, 
a tricky one, I know, but we at Clarin are currently uh, undergoing a process also of uh, monitoring uh, by mm -hmm. the ESPRI, and we're trying to quantify the impact of our infrastructure. So uh, maybe if you have some thoughts or ideas on how we could try to uh, define the, the contribution of Clarin at the various steps uh, here, not just the technical one, but also, you know, the fact of bringing all of you people together, for instance, it would be very interesting for us. Perhaps I can start here because I think we have three partial answers to this. The first one is actually it was a financial contribution from Clarin that made the prototype implementation of the transcription portal uh, feasible in the first place. So we got an, a start a financing to have a programmer do this and since then we've employed him so there is continuous support. It would not have been possible without this. And the second thing and third thing are that within the nas national Karin, actually this idea of a single sign on or making software available upon a single side and to provide all these web services, of course, this, these ideas were flowing around uh, in the net for a long time, but Clarin gave them a direction that made it useful. So when we saw that there were some web services available in Germany with, using Clarin, immediately it struck us, yes, we can carry, we can export some of our services to the web and make them much more useful to m many more people than they were before. So it was this idea of making small tools publicly available via the web and this single sign on really helped. And when we saw, we, we did this for Germany, we saw that even people outside of Germany will profit from this. So then the idea got bigger. So actually without Clarine, it would not have been, you might have still be doing pro, uh, phonetic processing and not offer a more general service. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this answer. <laughs> I, I would like to add something. <clears throat> uh, it has had also an unexpected spin-off because Sylvia invited me to collaborate uh, in an online seminar of the Italian Oral History Society. And I was asked together with Sylvia to write an article on the T-chain. So there is an article now on how to use the T-chain um, in an Italian volume in Italian which was also a way of trying to push the speech recognition movement in Italian in, in, in the right way. Yeah, definitely. Silvia has uh, helped a lot to set things in motion, the Italian side of things. Uh, in the in the meantime, uh, things are also going on in the chat, and uh, I would like maybe to read uh, uh, Irina uh, Marchuk's message. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thanking uh, uh, the project for collecting the interviews uh, as a, it's a very touching message as a survivor uh, of a daughter of a survivor of Ravensbrück. So I think, uh, I don't know if Irina wants to add a few, a few words uh, here. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me first of all? Yes, okay. Yes, uh, uh, yes thank you very much. Uh, um, it's not just me, there are other uh, women here who are children, daughters of former survivors, uh, a leader and, um, and um, Eliashevsky, two ladies, my sister, Christine, uh, Christine, Christine Eliashevsky. Sorry, uh, and um, my, my sister Oksana. Uh, um, it's really absolutely wonderful. It's, it's a, you put, I mean, there are projects at the Ukrainian Canadian Research and um, Documentation Center going on. Uh, uh, Kalena Butler, who is also part of this uh, audience, uh, uh, collected uh, uh, enormous amount of uh, documented enormous amounts of uh, women who were uh, in Ravensbrück. About eight thousand names have been already. She managed to establish eight thousand over 8,000 names. She's also currently, uh, but um, why should I'm telling that? I mean, she can she can speak for herself um, if you invited her. Uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful what you do. It just puts the, um, uh, the uh, sacrifices of the women 
in a in a place gives them a gives gives them a voice which they did not have during their lifetime. And I think that's absolutely wonderful work which you do. Fabulous, thank you. Thanks. Uh... Thanks a lot, uh, Irina, for this uh, testimony. I would say it's very important what you what you said, uh, giving a voice to those that uh, didn't have it uh, in their lifetime. And maybe this is a good moment to also uh, give the floor to uh, Ambra Laurenzi, the, the president of the Ravensbrück Committee, uh, who uh, wanted to say a few words. Uh, um, to switch your microphone number. Yes, uh, sorry. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, I am very happy to share this project uh, with you. I represent the delegates of the Ravensbrück International Committee, which is uh, an association set up shortly after the end of the war by the surviving deportees to conserve the memory of their deceased comrades and to preserve the place of their suffering. One of the arm of the committee is to be able to pass on to future generation a dutiful remembrance on a strong warning about the horror in the concentration camps. Gradually, the survivors, for obvious, ob, obvious reasons of age, had to leave this burdensome legacy in the hand of the second and the third generation. In our opinion, the voice from Ravensbrück project goes in the right direction in order to be able to spread international te um, testimonies of women from different European countries. The alternation of voice and language is a constant in the work of the committee. And beyond the inevitable difficulties, it's a fund fundamental aspect for understanding the history of Ravensbrück. The objectives of our association are evidently common and uh, to all the delegates, but uh, the political and the social transformations that have taken place in European countries in the almost 80 years since the end of the war have had different repercussions in consideration of the different post-war experience experienced by the countries and the division of two blocks in Europe. The possibility that the testimonies can be more easily found and be the object of study or simply of historical knowledge will be an excellent help for future generations via the web to better understand a history which, despite the difference, has been unifying. It was precisely with the spirit that the committee, together with the Ravensbrück Memorial, created the exhibition Face of Europe, portrait of the deportee mother of the woman of the committee. There are 28 portraits of our mothers in the 40s and the 50s when they were able to say they managed to survive. This exhibition will take place in the European Parliament in January, and such location is the proper place to give honor and respect 
to the woman of Ravensbrück. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to Ambra Lorenzini for this uh, uh, very moving and touching uh, testimony. Um, there are also some further information going on uh, in the chat uh, concerning the ongoing collection of uh, um, uh, prisoner uh, Ukrainian prisoners' testimonies. Um, so maybe also if you want to put uh, further references in the chat also to these uh, other initiatives. In any case, I would like to remind uh, you all that uh, uh, the slides of this uh, cafe will be soon available and uh, uh, therefore you will be able to access all the mentioned uh, archives uh, and projects. Um, I believe that maybe uh, we can quickly give the word to Rachel uh, Pistol, who uh, had to step away from her uh, uh, computer, but wished to say something about the Erie uh, infrastructure as well. Uh, thank you, Francesca, and apologies for the bad timing earlier when um, I did uh, have to step away from the computer. But uh, this is really a fantastic event, and thank you so much for sharing your research. Um, um, Erie has been meeting with some of the team uh, who's presented today and it's really great to hear in more detail uh, exactly what you've been working on because of course this is an area that's very important um, to the European Hol Holocaust research infrastructure also in terms of um, preserving these um, oral testimonies and um, understanding the best way to um, to transcribe them and to protect them and preserve them long term in terms of digital. So um, we are working at the moment Erie UK with um, Clarin UK to um, do a workshop in um, May. We're just uh, finalising the dates on this where we will be using some of the um, information from uh, Erie partners and using the Clarin tools and uh, bringing the two infrastructures together to, to show. So the work you're doing is, is really important and, and very useful uh, to us also. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And we will pass out information about this event once we've uh, finalized the dates. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot uh, for this, uh, uh, Rachel. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, this uh, uh, workshop is uh, now, uh, this cafe is now uh, drawing to an end. Uh, some of the testimonies that we've heard are really very important, but also uh, kind of hard to process in a way. Um, so uh, maybe I was suggesting that we could uh, listen to one of the voices from Ravensbrook, uh, uh, if this is uh, possible. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Sylvia or Christoph have, have one uh, ready uh, to, to hear. Uh, maybe ha um, I have a short uh, uh, clip of uh, Lydia Beccaria Rolfi describing the. Um, I'm a little bit moved, sorry. Um, uh, the story of the spoon. How was, uh, how was difficult to eat without spoon? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, Silvia, I think that when you share your screen, you'd have to, uh, there is a, there is a check uh, box that you have to press in order to ensure that the audio is uh, audible for us as well. You will need to reshare your slides. I will stop sharing right now. Uh, please click again uh, on the bottom of your screen, the share screen option, and then on the lower left angle, you need to enable share sound. 
il discorso del cucchiaio. Del cucchiaio. Ecco, del perché cucchiaio non danno il cucchiaio? Rientra, rientra nello stesso tipo di discorso. Certo, Volendoti certo. disumanizzare, ridurti a livello di bestia, sì, la sì, bestia sì, lecca. Certo, certo. Allora, istintivamente, tu già psicologicamente sei sì, pronto sì, 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 a sì. sentirti animale. Sì, sì. E, tanto è vero che una delle prime cose che il deportato acquista in campo è il cucchiaio, per non sentirsi bestia. Cioè, chi eh, tenta di reagire o lo ruba, o, o, o lo, lo compra, acquista, sì, o sì, lo acquista sì. con il pane, ma acquista sto cucchiaio per potersi sentire meno animale. E, perché se fosse stato qualcosa che si potesse mangiare con le mani, mm. le mani, le mani trasformate sì, sono sì, uno sì, strumento, certo, certo. ma visto che è sempre sì, minestra, minestra, sempre minestra, la devi leccare, mm. bere o leccare. Mm. E lì allora ti senti eh, effettivamente a livello di... di le frasi che, che ricorrevo erano non siamo mica dei cani. Eh già, non siamo mica non dei, siamo cani. dei cani. E piano piano ti rientravi nell'ordine di idee di essere, di essere un, cane, un cane, di essere una bestia, di poter essere trattato a, a calce, di poter essere picchiato, di poter essere utilizzato, e, ma essere trattato Quindi come un cane. Quindi è probabile che, come dici tu, la reazione, cioè io desidero avere il cucchiaio, non fosse tanto desidero avere il cucchiaio perché mi è più comodo mangiare col cucchiaio, no, no ma per non sentirmi bestia. Per non sentirti bestia. Sì. La prima cosa che ti acquisti, in fondo, ti dà meno fastidio non poterti pettinare mm. che dover leccare sì, la minestra. Sì, sì, certo, certo. Ti dà Quindi meno è fastidio. È un comportamento da bestia, proprio il comportamento. È, è uno dei tanti comportamenti sì, da bestia che ti impongono. L'uomo che lecca. L'uomo che lecca è bestia, è bestia. l'uomo che lecca è cane. Sì. <ride> Questo è la, proprio uno dei fattori, così come vestirti di stracci completamente quando arrivi. <ride> non ti lasciano nudo perché... Eh, sì, perché poi muori subito, certo. Era freddo, eh. ma penso che se avessero, eh, non avessero avuto dei problemi di clima ci avrebbero anche lasciati nudi, mm-hmm. perché così ti senti sì, sì, più, bestia, più bestia. bestia ancora. Poi senza niente di tu. Così il... quando... Il... Steph is translating... Uh, in a very, very wonderful way in the chat. Thank you, Steph. So I guess there's nothing left uh, for me to do other than uh, thank uh, the organizers of this uh, uh, Clarin Cafe, unless there is a some uh, final remarks that uh, you want to share share with us. Um, we are really looking forward to the publication of the oral uh, history uh, resource family uh, and uh, uh, to the new developments uh, also uh, Slavic uh, voices uh, from Ravensbrück, uh, wishing you all the best of luck with uh, the outcomes of the research uh, applications, which uh, will uh, enable um, this project to continue and to uh, and to uh, expand, because it, we that we can all agree that uh, uh, although uh, these uh, voices uh, have a very tough message for us, they must uh, be heard and they must uh, be preserved. And uh, so just a few closing uh, remarks. Uh, I will not uh, share my screen, but just put the links uh, in the chat. So the um, Clarin, uh, Clarin Cafe's uh, uh, initiatives uh, will continue uh, next year with a new program. Uh, if, uh, uh, I mean, we would be very happy to have you uh, in, in a year maybe to hear from updates. We do uh, updates cafe, so I will be really happy if you wanted to to do a second round next year. And uh, we've also uh, the thanks uh, uh, of uh, uh, Francisca de Jong, executive director of Clarin in, in, in the chat. If you want to stay um, updated, uh, up to date to our novel news and uh, events, uh, the links uh, are uh, in the chat. And uh, um, 
among which the link to the open calls for funding. So if you have ideas of uh, possible ways in which uh, Claren can help you with this very important types of research, please uh, uh, go ahead. And uh, um, once again, um, and yeah, this is uh, the last, last link to stay tuned with the next Claren Cafes. And uh, once again, thank you uh, all very much for to the organizers uh, uh, and uh, also to those uh, who attended. Thanks a lot to uh, Ambra Laurenzi for uh, being here with us and to all, uh, to Irina and all the other um, uh, daughters of uh, deportees who could be here today with us. And um, I then hereby close uh, this cafe and uh, wish you all a uh, happy new year in a way.